praise and worship on you. I mentioned somebody before before the service started, we have the lights on for the first time in months. We've been able to turn them on in this. I almost forgot we had lights in the sanctuary. Now we can turn them on this morning. But what that means for you is even though it is perfect nap weather, outside the lights are on. So if you nod off in the service, I'll be able to see you taking a nap in church. So there is a downside to having the lights on finally, but this cooler weather has enabled us to do that. Well, take out your Bible this morning. Turn once again to the fourth chapter of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4 this morning. We're finishing up our study in Philippians today, this, this study that I've been calling No Matter What. And we've been looking at how Paul, no matter what his circumstances, no matter what had gone on, how he was able to experience this steady sense of the joy of Christ in his life. And so we're finishing up that series today. Next Sunday, we're starting a series of sermons I'm calling We the People. And I mentioned earlier in the announcements time that later in the month of September, the church leadership's going to come together. We're going to have a series of discussions over the next several months considering what God's vision is for our church. Where do we see God leading Aviano Baptist Church here in the next several years? And, you know, when you do that, when you have a vision discussion like that, and whether you're Apple Computers or you're Yahoo or Facebook or Yaviano Baptist Church, when you have a discussion like that, a vision discussion, let's look down the road and see where we're going you don't start with questions like, what are we going to do? And what is our methodology going to be? You don't start with those questions. You start with much more basic questions. Who are we? Who do we see ourselves to be? And then what is it that we're about? Those are the questions you start with when you start to consider where you're going. And that's what I want us to do. This sermon series called We the People. Over the next several weeks, as the leadership is starting to have those conversations, I want us as a congregation to focus back on what the Word of God says about who we are as the people of God. Who are we as the church? Those are the questions we're going to be looking at. So, for example, when the Bible says that we're the bride of Christ, what does that mean? What does that mean not only just in general, what does it mean for us as we live out our lives as, as believers? We're the, by, the bride of Christ. How are we to understand it when the church is called the body of Christ or the family of God? How does that impact us? I, I want us to take a look at those kinds of questions. Now, starting next week. This morning, though, we're, we're finishing Philippians, and I think it's absolutely brilliant how Paul finishes this letter. I'm certain he's glad to know that I think so, but I think it's brilliant how he finishes this letter. You know, he's been building all along on these ideas that we've been calling potential joy stealers, right? The, the circumstances, some of the challenging issues that we come up with in life, and how those can have the tendency, or certainly can possibly be things that rob us of joy in life. And how relationship issues, how those, if, if those turn south and those become difficult, how those can have the tendency to, to maybe draw joy away from our lives. He's been building on those ideas of these potential joy stealers. And he's given us a lot of strategies on how to counter that. We've talked about those over the last several weeks. But then he comes to the end here, the last verses in the last chapter of the letter that he wrote. There were no chapters and verses when he wrote it to Philippi, but he comes to the end of his letter, the closing of it. And, he, and I think he ends, he drives all of that home with this interesting twist. He's been talking about how these things in our lives, both circumstances and potential people issues, how those can have sometimes under the right circumstances, how those can have the, the tendency to draw joy away. But then he twists it around at the end of this chapter, and he ends the letter with this. And I think this is kind of the big idea of these last verses. That those things that could be the greatest joy stealers, God often uses as the very things to be conduits of joy in our lives. Those circumstances, those relationships that we have, that those can have the tendency to draw joy out. But God often uses those as the very conduits that bring joy into our lives. So you've got your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 4. Just, so take, just take a look there at verse 10. That's where we'll start. Take a look there at verse 10. Because when he starts to, to, to end his letter, this is the point I believe he starts with. That God uses his people as a conduit for joy in our lives. We all know that some of the biggest challenges that you and I face on a day-to-day -day basis are relationship issues, right? Those are some of the biggest challenges that we have in life. And, and someone once said this, that church would be a perfect place if it weren't for all the people. Right? And that's a very true statement. But that we could say the same thing about a lot of things. We could say work would be a great place if it weren't for all those problem employees i got to work with, right? 
We could say work would be an amazing place. I love my job. Work would be a great place if it weren't for the fact that my boss is a jerk. We could say the same thing about work or school for that matter. This school would be a great place except the fact that I've got this difficult professor. Or school for our kids, maybe. School would be a wonderful place if it weren't for some of those other people that go there. Sometimes those are the biggest challenges that we have in life, right? The, they come from people issue relational problems. But here I think as he ends his letter, Paul is showing how God uses those things that could be the potential of pulling joy away from our lives and how God uses his people as a conduit to bring joy. Look at verse 10. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for before, but you lacked opportunity. And now jump down to verse 14. It's a little of a parenthetical in verses 11 through 13, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. But jump down, he sort of continues his thought down in verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even at Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am supplied amply, having received from Epaphroditus, which you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You know, as believers, as we go through our lives, we, we don't see our lives as a series of accidents, a series of coincidental things that take place, a series of completely disconnected dots. We don't see our lives that way as believers. It's not a series of accidents. As believers, we, we can and we should see it as a series of appointments, that God is at work. When, when people cross our paths, that's not an accident. That's not a coincidence. When things happen in our lives, those aren't accidents. Those aren't coincidences. God has worked those. Those are appointments. God is at work around us all the time, Jesus said in John chapter 5. My Father has been at work up to now, and I too am at work. God is at work around us in people and in circumstances. Those are appointments that God brings into our lives. We often refer to that as the providence of God. Right, the sovereignty of God. Providence is kind of a, an old time word, sort of an old fashioned word. But we talk about God's providence in our lives. And, and as well, we should. That word providence, though, is a Latin word. It comes from two Latin words, actually. It comes from the Latin word pro, which means before, and the Latin word video, which we use that word all the time, which means to see. Pro videoing. So providence literally is not just that God sees things ahead of time, that he sees down the road and knows what's coming, but that God sees to it ahead of time. He knows what is coming down the road and he sees to our needs. The idea of God going ahead of us, he sees to the things ahead of time that we're going to encounter. In John chapter 10, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. And he said this in verse 4 of John 10. He said, he, the, the good shepherd, is referring to himself sort of in the third person. He, the shepherd, goes ahead of the sheep. Now, I've mentioned before, I'm a city boy. I was born and raised in the suburbs. I've never dealt with sheep. I've never raised sheep. I've never been around animals, farms, that sort of thing. I know what sheep are. I can identify them. I've seen them cross the road and block traffic just like you have. But, but what's the role of a shepherd? I know enough to know what the role of a, a shepherd is. The role of a shepherd is to provide for the sheep, right? Sheep, can, sheep are helpless animals. They can do nothing on their own. The role of the shepherd is to provide for them. And the, a good shepherd, he doesn't lead from behind the flock. The sheep don't know where to go. He leads from the front. That's what Jesus said. He goes ahead of the sheep. And a good shepherd knows his flock. And he knows as he's leading that flock along, there will come a point in time, and he knows when this point in time is, there will come a point in time when they're going to need water. And as he leads them along, he leads them along purposely in a way that when they need water, that's where they're going to be, by the still waters. And he knows at what point in time, how far they can go before they're going to want to graze again. And as he leads them along, he says, oh, okay, we can walk this long and they're going to want to graze. He purposely leads them to that point where that, those green pastures are. So that when that need is there, 
they're already where that need can be met. I want you to notice the word that Paul uses there in verse 10. He said, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. I want you to notice that word revived. If you've got an NIV, it says renewed. I want you to notice the same word. If you've you got a King James, it says your need has flourished for me. It's all the same word in Greek. It's different words in English. But I want you to notice that word because that word is, is sort of an agricultural word. It, re, it refers to a plant that's been dormant all winter. And then when the, when the spring comes around, when the conditions are right, when the time is right, that plant begins to sprout up again. That's what that word talks about. And it's not that you might look at that plant in the winter and you see the, the leaves are all brown and maybe the stem looks brown, and you might be tempted to think that plant is dead. But it's not dead. It's, there's something going on beneath the surface that we don't see. It's just dormant for that period of time. It's not dead, it's waiting for the right time to sprout. Now, if it sprouts too early, you have an, a, an early warm, an early warming up the season. And if it sprouts too early, the frost may come and kill it off. And if it sprouts too late, maybe it stays cold too long and it sprouts too late, it's not going to be strong enough, it's not going to be big enough. When the heat from the summer comes, it's going to scorch that plant, it may very well kill it. At the right time, that plant sprouts. That's what that word means. The timing has to be just right for that plant to produce fruit. And that's exactly what Paul sees in the church in Philippi, that God has caused the concern of the Philippian church to be revived, to sprout again in him at just the right time when he needed it most. Jesus had said, and I'm no doubt this was on Paul's mind as he, as he thought about that as he saw what was happening from the Philippians, their concern from Jesus said, your father knows in advance what you need. He already knows what your needs are. And I think there can be a temptation in us to say, well, if God already knows what my needs are going to be, why would he let me struggle? I mean, why would he just take care of them right now? Why let it go on at any point in time? Why bring Paul to this point in prison and all before he finally revived that concern in the Philippian church to provide for them? Why would God do that when he could provide them sooner? You know, I think about a, a butterfly or a caterpillar as it goes through its metamorphosis into a butterfly. And it wraps itself up in the cocoon. You know, we might walk up to that cocoon and notice that little critter struggling inside that cocoon. And we might think to ourselves, you know, gosh, it looks like that little poor guy is just struggling really hard. I think that I, I can help him. And it, would, it almost seems mean to not help him. I think the, the right thing, the loving thing, the kind thing, for me to do would just be to take a little box knife, a little, little pocket knife, and just cut that cocoon open. Let him out. End his struggle, right? And we might say to ourselves, I've done a good thing. I could help him at that moment. I ended his struggle. That's a great thing. And though his struggle ended, we've really done him more harm than good. Because the struggle that that little caterpillar goes through to finally come out of that cocoon is what gives him the strength to fly. If that's what he needs to be able to fly to gather food, that's what he needs to be able to get away from predators. If we let him out early, the timing is wrong. We've brought a solution, but we haven't brought a good one. And God allows right up at the perfect time, God revives their concern for him right at the time when Paul needed it. And Paul saw God's hand at work through the church in Philippi. He saw what James had said Years earlier, before Paul wrote Philippians, James said, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Everything that happens, this is God at work in his people. This is not an accident, this is an appointment. This is a specific time that God has arranged specifically for this to happen. And see, for Paul, he saw it much more than just as a financial gift. It wasn't just a check that showed up in the mail for him. Verses 14 and 15, he says, you shared with me in these struggles. You shared with me in the things that were going on. That's the Greek word koinonia. And if you've been around church at all, you've been around church for a while, you've heard that word, and we often just talk about it as a fellowship, and that's exactly what it means, koinonia. But it means more than that. It's not just getting together, hanging out, enjoying some time together. That's not really what the word means. It's, it's much deeper than that. It means to share in something, to be a co-participant in something. That's what the Greek idea of 
koinonia means, that fellowship idea. And he said, you didn't just send me a check from afar. You, as much as you could, you were very much involved in this with me. You see how, saw, how Paul saw those people, saw the people of God as God's conduit to provide joy, to be the, the blessing to him. He said, you were very much involved with me as we went through this. Not physically, but he knew they were with him in prayer. They were aware of what was going on in his life. They knew what was happening. They were lifting him up in prayer. They were, as best they could, they were with him in spirit, with him in thought. As best they could, they were walking with him. And listen to the joy it brought in Paul's life. As he talked earlier in the letter, how sometimes relational matters can be joy stealers from us. Listen to the joy that Paul sees in this relationship that he has with the Philippians. Verse 10, he says, I rejoice greatly. Verse 14, you have done well. Verse 15, you alone were with me. Verse 16, again and again you provided for me. Verses 17 and 18, you blessed me and I pray that God blesses you. Paul saw the people of God as a conduit for God to bring joy in to his life. Listen, realize that that person, that one that's, that's in your life, that's not an accident. I mean, you may, you may, a person comes to mind, maybe they're a difficult person. Maybe there's a person that it's a great joy for you to know. But regardless, that person in your life is not an accident. The fact that your paths crossed, that wasn't some coincidence. God has brought that person into your life with a divine appointment. Maybe the, the reason he did that, maybe it's so that they can be a conduit of joy in your life. Or very likely, maybe it's so you can be a conduit of joy into theirs. But either way, God has brought that person into your life. And, and for us, it's, it's like Paul to always be looking for that opportune moment to have the joy of the Lord revived in us through those circumstances. And Paul saw that though people can sometimes, relational issues can sometimes be a joy stealer, very often God uses the people in our lives to be a conduit to bring his joy. But not only that, he saw that God uses circumstances as conduits for joy. Remember, that was the other issue that he talked about. The other issue is a potential joy stealer are the situations and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But he said, you know what, sometimes, oftentimes, God uses those as a conduit to bring his joy. If we'll notice it, if we'll see it. Look at verse 11. I mentioned a little parenthetical in verse 11 through 13. He said, not that I speak from want... For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. In, every, in, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled, going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. And here's the secret, verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the second letter that we know of that he wrote, to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists out the things that he had gone through. And he I have to read the entire thing. The list could very well be a woe is me session from Paul. Let me tell you all the difficulties, because sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes in life, circumstances seem like they've conspired against us, right? I mean, if you've got children, they're starting back to school this week. And tomorrow, I can almost guarantee <laughs> I can almost guarantee that tomorrow will not go as you planned. You'll try to get those kids out the door. You have a plan. I'm going to get them all together, and I'm going to move them towards the door. And I remember our kids were young once. It's like herding cats to get them to the front door, right? You get two or three of them moving, and one runs off. And you go to get that one, and the other one runs off. And something's going to happen. You'll be moving them towards the door, and somebody's going to spill something on their shirt. And i got to go back, and i gotta, I got to help them change their clothes. You'll leave the house, and it'll start to pour. I don't have an umbrella, and i got to go back, and i got to get that. You'll get in the car and turn the key, and the car won't start. And sometimes life is like that, right? It seems like everything is conspiring against you. Now, listen to Paul's account of his life, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is not a woe is me. That's not where Paul's going with this, but listen to his account in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I have to read the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but you've got to get the whole picture. Verses 24 to 28, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Paul was not the travel companion that you wanted to have along on your trip. I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, sort of a summary statement of all the things that you know, had gone on in Paul's life. And we can look at that and say, oh, my goodness. If anyone ever had opportunity, ever had a chance to say, circumstances are conspiring against me, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But that's not, that's not the way he saw it. Because with all of that, and by the way, all of that happened before he wrote Philippians. With all of that, listen again to what he said in verse 11. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Now, the dictionary defines contentment this way, because that's the key phrase there. Paul has learned to be content in whatever circumstances he finds himself in. And the dictionary defines contentment this way. A mental or emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease with one's circumstance. But I want you to notice what, what Paul said there in verse 11. Maybe more specifically, notice what he did not say. He did not say he was content with his circumstances. He said he was content in them. That's a very different thing. To say I'm content with my circumstances means that all those things that he listed in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he looked at all of those and said, I'm okay with that. I'm at ease with that. But how could he possibly be at ease with all of that? 39 lashes five times, beaten with rods three times, always in danger every time he turned around. How could he possibly be at ease with that? That doesn't make sense. But that's not what he said. He said, I have learned to be content in that. That stuff, that's completely different. Regardless of my circumstances, I have learned the secret of contentment. And it doesn't have anything to do with them. It doesn't have, it's not affected one single bit. And it's something he learned over time. That's not a natural thing for us, to be content in our circumstances. The human heart is always discontented, always looking for something different, always looking for something more, never quite satisfied with what I have. The human heart is never content. That's not a natural thing. In fact, Pastor Matt Chandler said it this way, he said, if we have to learn to be content in our circumstances, it means it does not come naturally to us. That's the reality. The human heart is not content. Now, Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5 what the human heart is like. The heart of man, Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. In the heart of man is sexual immorality, discord, jealousy, dissensions, factions, no contentment. That's what the heart of man is like, our default settings right there. That's the heart of man. And he said, listen, we come into relationships and we say, I'm not, I'm not satisfied physically with all of this. I'm going to chase some immoral activities. I'm going to chase some immoral things. I see something happening in your life and it makes me jealous, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring up some dissension. I'm going to bring up some discord. I'm going to drive some factions. No contentment. That's the heart of man. But he also says, just couple of verses, one verse later, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of God's Spirit in our lives. That's what the fruit means. The evidence of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. I'll just read a few of them, not all of them. The fruit of the Spirit is joy and peace and self-control. That's not natural to man. That's the evidence of God within us. That only comes from Him. The heart drives us the other direction. And Paul said, I've learned by experience. That's what that word means. It's that I've learned in all of my circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul heard a sermon on contentment one time, and he said, you know what, I, that really is something I probably ought to practice a little more. I think when I, when I leave church today, I will practice. I will intentionally try to be more content with it. It doesn't mean that. He learned it by just hearing some information. 
It doesn't mean that Paul led, read the, the latest book on contentment and said, yeah, that's a great idea. That's something I really ought to apply in my life. He didn't learn it that way. That, that word that I have learned, it means I've learned it through experience, through the things that God has brought me through, all of those things we just looked at. I have learned to be content in the midst of those. Now, contentment's not pretending that everything's okay when it's not. It's not ignoring the facts. It's not ignoring the hardships. I seriously doubt when he was getting, when he was getting beaten with rods or whipped with that cat of nine tails, I seriously doubt Paul was pretending everything was okay when it was not. Contentment is not that. The word content meant to be contained. And what that means is that the resources that God has given us are already contained within us. We just have to tap into them. We just have to realize we're there. We just have to use them. But his resources are already there. The Greek philosophers in Paul's day used that word to mean self-sufficient. You rely on yourself. You, you reach down within yourself and steal yourself up for the next round. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's the way the Greek philosophers use that word. But that's not at all what Paul learned. He didn't learn, listen, if I'm going to go on through this, if I'm going to be able to carry on and get, and get back up from this beating, back into the work of God, carry on to the next place that God has for me, it's not because of my own strength. It's not my ability to reach deep down within me and find some inner sense of strength I have in myself. It wasn't that. Did you hear where strength came from? What he had learned, the secret he learned. Verse 13, one more time. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who gives me strength. That is the source of his strength. That is what is contained already within him. That resource that enables him to see those circumstances and learn and say, what is God, how has God carried me through all of that stuff? He'll carry me through whatever is next. Jesus taught the same thing in John chapter 15. He talked there about the vine and the branches. And you know, if you cut a branch off from the vine and you lay it off to the side, that branch is not going to produce fruit anymore. It's not going to do anything. That branch is useless and absolutely dead on its own. But when it's connected to the vine, you know, that, that branch can produce fruit when it's connected to the vine, but it doesn't produce fruit because of its own activity. It doesn't produce fruit because of its own effort. We've got a whole yard full of fruit trees in front of our house. And, you know, when those trees are producing fruit, if you've ever walked by a fruit tree, you never hear it straining, Right? You never hear it grunting, working really hard. Man, i got to really turn out some apples today. You don't hear that with a fruit tree, right? Because those branches don't produce fruit on their own. It's not because of their effort. What is it because of? The resources they're tapped into in the vine. And the resources from that vine are flowing through that branch. That's what produces the fruit. Paul said, listen, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance that I'm in, because the resources of Christ are contained within me. My only task is to let them flow out. God often brings circumstances into our lives, and we will refer to them as a test of our faith. And sometimes they are. So God's testing my faith. That's where this circumstance, that's where the situation came from. It's a test of my faith. But I want you to realize something. Listen very carefully, church. When those tests of faith come into our lives, those tests are not for God's sake. Think about that for just a minute. Those tests of faith that God allows or brings into our lives, they are not for His sake. Listen, God knows where your strength is going to run out. He already knows where your faith is going to fail. He knows that. He doesn't learn anything new by bringing that test of faith into your life and to mine. You know why He brings them? Because we don't know. We have to know that point at which my strength is going to give out. We have to know that point at which my faith is going to fail. And by the way, that point is much closer than you think it is. We have to know that I might get a step, a step and a half before my resources are going to give out. He brings those tests of faith in our lives for the same reason he brought them into Paul. 
so that we learn to rely not on resources that I have, but on resources that come from the vine. Resources I do not have on my own that only come from him. And Paul saw these incredible difficult circumstances that he was in and had been in. And he saw them as opportunities where God was teaching him through experience to rely on the resources that were only available in Christ. He said, these, cir these circumstances in my life are a conduit to bring God's joy. They could be a conduit for great pain, but they're a conduit to bring God's joy. So he saw that God uses his people as a conduit for joy. He uses circumstances as a conduit for joy. And the last thing I want us to see, Paul learned this lesson that no matter what, Christ is sufficient. Verse 19. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. When I went to officer training school in 1994, I know you might have been born in 1994, so you can't even fathom doing anything productive at that point in time, but when I went there in 1994, my wife sent me two little plaques in the mail for me to put on the desk in my dorm room. One was verse 13, and the other was verse 19. And those two verses, I think, are bookends. They complete the same thought. Verse 13, he said, I can do all things through Christ. Verse 19, my God will supply all things. They finish the same thought. They're bookends. And notice in verse 19, two things. First of all, notice how many needs he said he's going to supply. How many of our needs my God will supply? He didn't say he'll supply most of them. Well, there will come a point in time when God's resources are going to run out. He'll get me this far. He can carry me only so far, but then I'm on my own after that. He didn't say he'll provide most of our needs. He didn't say he'll supply many of our needs, every single one. And notice the other, the other thing. Where is he drawing from? What resource does God draw from to provide those needs? His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now let me ask you this. Is there anything that God doesn't already own? Is there anything in this world that if we were to look in the file cabinet and look up the, the title or the deed of that thing to include your life, is there anything in this world that God doesn't already own? That's part of the resources he's pulling from. God speaking through the psalmist in Psalm 50, he said this, All of the animals of the forest are mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. The world is mine and everything in it. When we come into a need and we question, is, is God going to be sufficient? Is there anything he doesn't already own? Is there any wisdom that God is lacking? Anything he doesn't know already? You know, we, we might look at a circumstance and say, boy, I really know myself. And I know how limited or how challenges I'm, challenged I'm going to be as I come into this. I know this situation very well. A lot of experience. God, I'm not sure you've got this. Is there any wisdom that God doesn't already have? Romans chapter 11, verses 34 to 36. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is judgment. His paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Is there any wisdom that God doesn't have? That's part of the resources he's drawing from. When he said he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory, is there anything that God cannot handle? Any circumstance, any situation where you say, God, I'm not sure you're up to the task here. Speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, he said this, Jeremiah 32, 27. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And then rhetorically, he asked this, Is anything too difficult for me? And Jesus echoed that. Nothing will be impossible for God. In any at all circumstances, people problems, situation problems, it doesn't make any difference. No matter what, Christ is sufficient to meet that need. And I think as we wrap up this series called No Matter What, I think it's fitting to end on that verse. And there's a story several years ago of Dallas Theological Seminary in their early years of the seminary. They were in some serious financial trouble, and they, and they, they thought they may have to close the seminary if they couldn't come up with $10,000 fairly quickly. 
Now, this was in the 1920s, and so $10,000 was a significant sum of money back in those days. And so the, the president of the seminary, the founders sat around. They had a prayer meeting. In the course of that prayer meeting, one of the founders prayed this. He said, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Would you sell some of those cattle and provide for this need? A week or two later, the president was in his office, and he was opening the mail. And as he, as he read one of the letters, tears began to flow down his face. And this is what the letter said. It was from a, a rancher somewhere in Texas. They didn't know him. He didn't know them. The letter said this. It said, several weeks ago, I was trying to pull together this business deal. And I sold several head of my cattle to raise the money for this deal. But then the deal fell apart. But I already had this money, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I felt the Lord impress upon me that I should give it to the seminary. I don't know if you can use it, but here's a check for $10,000. To see God at work that way, and to realize that that, that that same God that Paul could say this about, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory, things that we don't even know of. That same God that was at work in that situation in the Dallas Seminary is the same God that's at work in your life and in mine. And the secret that Paul learned was not to rely on himself, not to rely on his smarts, not to rely on his talent or his wits. All that would fail him, and all of yours will fail you too. Not to rely on those things. The secret he learned was that to experience joy and contentment no matter what was to see that God works through people. God works through circumstances as a conduit to bring joy. But more than that, And apart from those things, that God alone is sufficient for whatever our needs might be. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, what an awesome God you are. You took Paul through all of that stuff, all of those circumstances, all of those situations. And in every one of them, you you were teaching him one more lesson, one little more thing where he knew how he could rely on you. God came through last time, and I know he'll come through again. Father, I realize there might be one here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. That's the greatest need that we have, to have our, our sins forgiven, to be reconciled unto you. No matter what happens in this world, that is the greatest thing we need. Father, I pray as we enter these moments of invitation, you just continue to impress upon that one's heart the need to to allow you to meet that lord you knew that need in advance before the foundation of the world jesus was the lamb who was slain you had already gone before us to provide for that lord i pray that one here today that doesn't know you as savior today would be the day where they would realize that apply that to their lives have their sins forgiven and be reconciled to you and your children here this morning, Lord, very often we forget. We forget that you are sufficient. Lord, as we go into this time of invitation, if there's, as your spirit continues to speak, there's one that just needs to respond and just be encouraged or just have someone come alongside, then, Father, I pray you give them the boldness to step out. Lord, would you continue to speak to us and teach, to us, teach us in these moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stand with us as we sing our hymn of invitation. If there's a decision you need to make this morning, whether to trust in Christ or you just need someone to pray with you or come to this altar, this is your time. to.